Welcome to Anatomy Physiology Lab 1, and this is Karen Drake, your teacher. This lab manual is brand new, so I want to go over a couple of things with you. First of all, this first lab is a killer. It's 26 pages long, so they won't all be this dense with material. But you need this information so that as we go into the next labs, then you'll have the foundation when we use certain words, and you won't be going, what are they talking about? So it, you need to spend time going over this material. You have to pass both the lab and the lecture to get credit for Anatomy 1. So keep that in mind. There are 10 labs that we will cover this semester, and this week we're going to be working with anatomical positions, directional terminology, and how to use the microscope. Some of you are coming straight from high school to college, and you may have the high school mentality that some high schools have. You have to show up for class, you have to do the labs, and you have to know the information. You can't make excuses like, my dog was sick, or I needed to get my car fixed, or I forgot to set my alarm. Those things just won't cut it. So. If you do start into that uh, mindset, you may as well drop the class and take it when you have time and the motivation to take this. So the reason you're taking this lab is to learn this information so that you can go into a healthcare profession. That's at least why I think you're in this class. If you're not, uh, you need to go talk to your advisor and say, why did you put me in anatomy physiology one? Because that's a really, really hard class with a lot of material to memorize. Most of the healthcare paths have a national board exam that you have to take at the end of the degree. So if you go through and you cheat, you don't show up for class, you don't learn the material, when you get to the board exam, you won't pass it. So you will have wasted two years of your life or however many years it takes you to get whichever degree you're working on. So Keep that in mind. You're not trying to get through the class. You're not trying to get with as least amount of work as you can do. You're going to embrace this material and go, yeah, I need this material. I need to learn it. Now, those of you who are meeting in person, you need to wear long pants to cover your legs, and you need not wear sandals. You need shoes that have the toes closed. Now, for this particular lab, it's not that important. But it's good to get into the habit of going into a laboratory with the correct personal safety equipment on. A lot of times I have students email me and ask me, well, what's going to be on the test? What do I need to study? Well, you need to study everything in the lab. But to make it a little bit more coherent, for those who like bulleted items, here are the things that you should be able to do. So once you finish the lab and you think you're memorized everything, go through and say, ah, what, are, what is the correct anatomical position? And see if you actually know what it is. Could you talk your way through how to focus a microscope and find a specimen on there? So these are the things that we're going to do in lab, and you are responsible for knowing how to do them, knowing the words involved, after you've looked at the objectives, now we break down into what each of the things we're going to do to meet those objectives. So here's the lab instructions. We're going to lose, use the microscope. And if you go down to the dollar store and buy a doll for like a buck, you can buy a baby doll, then you can label the baby doll yourself. The first thing we're going to talk about is anatomical position. How can you stand and show the correct anatomical position? This is more important than you would think because, first of all, most people, when they walk up to someone, they're looking at the mirror image of themselves. So what is your right hand is their left hand. And if you happen to be a surgeon and it says cut off the right hand and they're looking down at the body, if they're not thinking, they'll cut off the left hand because it corresponds to their right hand. So it, this is surprisingly common occurrence that they just are thinking, okay, 
this is my right, therefore that's their right. And, and you get that wrong. The other thing is, when you're talking about, say, taking an x-ray or doing a CAT scan, they expect you to know the correct anatomical position to put the patient in that one. Or if they're referring to the hand, for example, I need a, a CAT scan or an x-ray of the hand, the correct anatomical position is to have the hand with the thumb pointed outward. That will be important when we learn blood vessels. That will be important when we learn nerves. Correct anatomical position is the thumb out. The feet, these actually, if he was in the correct anatomical position, he will be rocked back on his heels. So the underside of his foot is, pa is facing forward, and that's the plantar surface. But in the case of the correct anatomical position, it's considered the front or the anterior or the ventral surface. And then the top of the foot, where you tie your shoelaces, that would be considered the back of the foot or the dorsal. This particular figure is gender neutral, but if this was a guy, the correct anatomical position would be for him to have an erection. And that means that all the part with the erection that is touching his body, that would be the dorsal or the back part of the penis. The next set of concepts we're going to look at is directional terminology and planes of reference. The planes of reference are especially important for people who are doing x-rays or imaging of any sort and people who are going to be surgeons. It says in here, you don't say, well, it's above the heart or below the heart. We use the word superior, meaning closer to the head, or inferior, which is further away. So whenever you're talking about two different things, you can indicate which one is on top, which one's deep, which one's superficial. When you use the word medial, you're talking about close to the midline of the body. So your belly button is medial because it's close to the midline of your body. Lateral is towards the outside of your body. So your arms are lateral. You're on the outside. Your breast would be medial. If, if it's not medial or lateral, it is intermediate. I already mentioned that towards the head is superior and towards the feet is inferior. And then we're going to talk about anterior and posterior. Now, anterior is the front of you, and another word for it is ventral. And posterior is the back of you, and another word for that is dorsal. Now, the way I remember that easily is because a shark has a dorsal fin on its back. So if you can remember that the shark's dorsal fin is on its back, then you're going to be able to remember that dorsal means your backside. Now, why do they have two sets of words that mean the same thing? Well, in humans, we stand erect. So our anterior and ventral are the same, and our posterior and dorsal are the same. But if you happen to be a dog or a cat, you're down on all fours. So the back of the cat or the back of the dog, the dorsal region, is the part that you would pet. But if you're talking about anterior and posterior, you're talking about the tail region and the head region. So you see that that's different if you're down on all fours. But because we're upright, we're, all, we're going to use anterior and ventral to mean the same thing. But it's not true with other animals. But this is human anatomy, so you don't have to worry about cats and dogs and other things like snakes. The next couple of words that we need to learn are proximal and distal. And you should be able to have no problem with this one because you know the word distant means far away. So distal things are furthest away from the body. And proximal is in close proximity to the body or the core of the body, as some people call it. So if I were to give you two things, for example, the wrist and the elbow, which one is distal? Well, the wrist is the farthest away you can get. And proximal 
is the, the elbow, and that's closer to the body. Now, here's where you, here's a little tricky hint. I'm going to give you a, a hint that you might see this particular question. If you are talking about is the thumb proximal or distal to the little finger, if you don't know the correct anatomical position and know that the thumb points away from the body, then you're not going to realize the thumb is distal and the little finger is proximal. So there we're putting two different concepts that you've learned together. So proximal, closest to the body, distal, farthest away from the body. And then if you're talking about superficial versus deep. So you've, you've heard the saying, beauty is only skin deep. And then you've probably heard somebody talk about uh, that person is so superficial. So superficial is as close as you can get to the body surface, to the skin covering the body. And then deep, you go deep down inside and you're going to find that you have muscles inside there, you have visceral organs, you have your spinal cord and your vertebra. So all those things are deep down inside of you, as opposed to skin, which is superficial. You are going to meet the muscle men in other labs, but in this one, what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out if you can use the terms we just went over, superficial and deep, proximal and distal, anterior uh, versus posterior, things like that. So here are the guys. They're labeled. Here's D, right there. There's A and B. So you notice he's got numbers on him, or excuse me, letters on him. And then you come down here, and here is your first activity that you guys need to do. Now this is where it's nice to have friends in class and go over this material with them. I am not suggesting that you find a friend who's going to give you the answers. That's not what I want you to do. I want you to sit down and says, well, A is what to B? So you're looking up here. Here's A, and here's B. Well, definitely A is superior because it's closer to the head, and B is inferior because it's closer uh, or below the head, so it's further away from the head. You need to look at these things and see if you can figure out which term that they're using. If you have a question, now some students will email me or text me and say, hey, would you give me the answers to the activity? And my answer is no. So I can do that one really fast. But if you say, okay, I, I am not sure what they're talking about when they're looking at C and D. Because C is on the front and D is on the back. And then usually about that time they go, oh. So that would make D dorsal and C would be ventral. Oh. So a lot of times, if you ask me the question, as you're asking me the question, you answer it yourself. So if you have a question, I'm happy to help you. But if you just want me to do your work for you, I'm not doing you any favor. Now you're going to see these several places in several other labs. So again, bite the bullet and learn this material. We're going to talk about cutting the body. Directions will be, I need some sagittal cuts or I need some frontal cuts. If you are cutting like between the breast or between the eyes, you're cutting the person in half longwise, that's called sagittal. And if you get it directly where you get half the nose on one side and half the you know, one eye on one side, half the body on one side, half on the other, then you've done a mid-sagittal. The mid, there's only one mid-sagittal cut. But you can do a sagittal cut, and you can start with the arm and go in until you get to the neck, if you're maybe imaging the breast or something. So you can start, but sagittal tells you that they want you to cut in the plane as if you were going to cut the body in half longwise. And then you have the coronal, which is also known as the frontal plane. I remember it as coronal 
because if you're wearing a crown, the crown fits across your head right there. Hopefully you guys can see my cursor. So that, but here you go. If you want to cut the dorsal and the ventral sections, then you would do this kind of a plane. And then here is the cross section, also known as transverse. So if I were to cut your scalp, that would be a transverse or cross section. If I cut your head off, if I cut you around the waist, so any of these planes cutting downward is going to be a cross section, also known as a transverse plane. So if you look at these imaging pictures, you should be able to see what plane they were cut in. Now this one, you can see half the nose, half the mouth, half the brain. So you know that this person had a mid-sagittal cut. So now you're looking at this half of the person. Here, they've taken the person and they've cut them. Here's the, the uh, spinal cord and the vertebra around the spinal cord. And then you can see bits and pieces of the internal organs right there. So what they've done on this one is they've done a cross section or a transverse cut. So that's what that one is. And then here's the heart. It's kind of neat, this picture, because you can see the coronary arteries. You've probably heard somebody say, oh my gosh, he's going to have a coronary. They're talking about these blood vessels getting blocked. And it actually looks like there's a problem right there. So this is kind of a neat picture right there. But it could just be the dye that they're injecting into the person so that you can see their arteries. If you're going to be a person who does imaging, you are not allowed to tell the patient what you see. You're just supposed to take the picture and then give it to the physician and let them make the determination and then let them get back with it. That's one of the hard things to do. When you see something and the person's like, please, please, please tell me what you see, and you're just, you're not allowed to do it. For those of you who are taking the lab in person, we have some sheep brains that were sliced up in various uh, planes. And so you need to look at those and figure out if it's a um, sagittal or a transverse or a coronal cut. When we get into studying the muscles, we're going to have some things that are not sagittal, coronal, or transverse. So if it is at an angle, we say it is oblique. So we don't have any oblique things in this particular lab, but we're definitely going to run into them in the, in the future lab. The third set of information that you guys need to know for this lab is the surface regions and the quadrants of the abdomen. So those are, those are the two things we're going to go over right now. This is where I suggest you get a doll. This is the kind of doll you can get at the dollar store, but you can name the frontal region, which is this region right here, and the oral region, nasal region, umbilical region. So if you have a naked little baby doll, then you can look for all the different regions that you're required to know. This is interesting because this doll is completely not in the correct anatomical position. So the first thing is, its thumbs are pointing inward instead of outward. So that's not correct. And he is not erect. Therefore, this is the dorsal region, but it's pointing in the front direction. It's in the... Um, anterior or ventral region. So that's not correct. And then the feet, he's got his feet turned downward and his feet should actually be flipped upward. So this is the dorsal surface of the foot right there, but it's pointing towards the front. So I thought it was interesting that the doll that they chose was completely not in the correct anatomical position. A lot of these words come from Latin. There are people who pronounce different words different ways. There's also a movement of foot to rename certain areas. So if you see something with a slash, it means either this term or that term. For example, cephalic. Like if you talk about someone who's hydrocephalic, they have water on the brain. Hydrocephalic. But most of us use the word cranial to, have to deal with the, the head region, the cranial region. The frontal region 
is the front of your forehead. The orbital is around your eyes. I guess because you can roll your eyes. Nasal is very easy. That's your nose. Buccal. That is your cheek. So as you go over, the, this is your next assignment that you're supposed to do. You're supposed to label these. I'm looking to see. It looks like this line would be nasal because it's touching his nose. And it looks like this one right there would be the buccal because it's, it's touching his cheek. One of my favorite stories, when I was talking with one of my students, I asked him where his buccal region was, and he said he didn't know. And I said, well, it's your cheek region. He goes, oh. And so he grabbed his buttocks. So I said, no, no, not those cheeks, the cheeks on your face. I find it interesting that the chin is called the mental region. So the way I remember that one is I think about a statue by Rodin where he's, he's got his hand on his chin and his elbow on his knee, and you can see he's thinking about stuff. So he's being very mental. So your chin is your mental region. And when we learn the parts of the skull, you're going to find out that there's holes in the chin, in the skull of the chin, to allow nerves and blood vessels through. So we're going to run across the word mental several more times throughout this semester. Cervical region, I always have funny stories that help me remember these various things. So the cervical region is the back of your neck. For most women, our cervical region, the one that comes to mind when you say the word cervix, would be the bottom of our uterus, which hangs down in our vagina. Guys just have a cervical region for the neck, and girls have a cervical region at the bottom of their uterus and at the back of their neck. So that, that's a little bit confusing. But whenever you see the word cervical, just assume that they're talking about the area between your head and your shoulders, your neck region. Sternal, that's where your sternum is. And if you know the sternal region, then once you start learning the bones and the muscles, that's going to help you out so much because you already know where your sternal region is. Most everybody knows where your pectoral region is because most people have been exposed to fitness training and stuff like that. So the pecs, if you build up your pectoral muscles, then your breast will stick out. If you take a little time and put a story with each one of the words, it'll help you remember it for sure. All right, axillary. Back before they had these thermometers where they shoot you in the ear, or, or rub it across your forehead to get your temperature. They used to have mercury thermometers and they stuck them under your arm or in your anus or under your tongue. Hopefully not the same thermometer. But anyway, so if you stick a thermometer under the arms, you stuck it in the axillary region. Axillary is your armpit. So that's where you put your deodorant on, that's where you shave your axillary region. The abdominal region, is below your breast, okay. uh, umbilical region. It, when I was teaching at Southeast Community College, which is down around Whitesburg, Cumberland, they called the umbilical cord the biblical cord. And I thought that was kind of fun. So, but everyone should know the umbilical cord is what they cut off between the mother and the child, and then it eventually ends up being your belly button. Inguinal region. That's where your leg joins with your body. So it's that fold that I always talk to my students because you're going to go, a lot of you are going to go into nursing. And one of the things that I have found is when you're giving somebody a bath, you generally just kind of wash their armpits and maybe wash their face off a little bit. But most people don't want to get down into their personal spaces like the inguinal region. And so what happens is, especially if you've been in the hospital for a while, you start growing this really smelly, cheesy stuff in the inguinal region. So you want to keep that clean so that that stuff doesn't start growing. But it's really easy to tell somebody who hasn't been cleaned. Because when you, when you have them spread their legs apart, 
then you're just hit with the smell of the stuff that's growing there in the crack between the, the leg and the trunk of the body. Your pubic region is where you have your genitalia. That's, so guys are going to have a penis there and girls are going to have a vagina there. Scapula is the scapular region. That is where your, your scapular bone is. It's also known as the shoulder blade. If you put your hand up on your shoulder and pat yourself on the back, you're patting your scapular region. The vertebral region, that's easy. That's just the vertebra that run up and down your back and your spinal cord is down inside of it. Lumbar. If you put your hands on your hips and extend your fingers out around, you are encircling your lumbar region. Now, I used to, women felt that their lumbar region should be so narrow that if you put your hands around their waist or their lumbar region, that your fingers should touch. That's not healthy. You're not supposed to be that skinny in the waist. So, but, so they wore corsets and they did all kinds of torture to where a lot of times they'd faint because they literally couldn't breathe. So lumbar region is basically, it's in your, it's your waist. And then when we get into uh, looking at the vertebra, then we're going to talk about the cervical vertebra, which are up at your neck, and then the thoracic, which come down and run down through your abdomen. And then you get to your lumbar, which is your waist. And then sacral is below the lumbar. If you were to put your hands on your hips and then scoot them around towards the back, you would be putting your hands over your sacral region. And you'll see, to me, it kind of looks like the bones have fused into the head of a serpent. The gluteal region is where your gluteus maximus is. So that would be, uh, in common terms, your butt cheeks. So that's, that's in your posterior region or your dorsal region. Perineal region is the region between the anus and the genitalia. For a woman, it would be the area where a lot of times when they're giving birth, they cut through the perineal region to make a bigger opening for the baby to come out. So they do an episiotomy. I was asking Alexa what were some other interesting things that, about the perineal region, and she said that it's the place where ticks like to attach. So they crawl up your pants leg and they get up there past the fold, your inguinal fold, and then they get over into the perineal region and uh, they can bite down and hang out with you. The acromial region is one of the hardest ones to remember, but as we go through and we keep reusing that word over and over, lab after lab, it's like all of a sudden you just go, oh, okay, okay, I know where the acromial region is. But, so we know the axillary region is the armpit. Uh, so where the shoulder and the arm attach on the top, that's the acromial region. The brachial region is the upper arm, and the antecubital region is the inside of your elbow. That's where, if they're gonna start an IV, they almost always go there. If they're gonna draw blood from you, they almost always go to the antecubital region. So that's the fold where your lower arm and your upper arm meet on the inside of your elbow. The cubital region is your actual elbow. And for those of you who are of a certain religion, you know about Noah's Ark, and you know, if you've read about it, that they measured the diameter and the width and the height of the ark in cubits. And back then, they didn't have all the fancy stuff that we have nowadays. So a cubit was the distance from the tip of your finger up to your elbow. So if they were going to build the ark using my cubit, it would be a very small ark because I'm a very short, small person. Antecubital is the inner side. That's where you stick the needles in when you're drawing blood. And the cubital is the outer part that you end up bumping your elbow on stuff. They're, this means that they're trying to rename the cubital region the oleocranal region. And you're going to find out that when we look at the ends of the bones and how they hook together to make the elbow, 
the name of, of uh, part of one of the bones is yellow cranon. That's one of the reasons they do that. Because if you see that and you know the bones, then you're going to know that's the elbow. Uh, working with bones, maybe we're not going to be a, a physical therapy assistant or physical therapist. Then most of us would just call the elbow the cubital region. All right, so we said the brachial region is the upper arm and the antibrachial region is the lower arm. So that's kind of easy to remember. And cubital is the, is the posterior elbow and the antecubital is the anterior, or the front. Uh, carpal, used to, students had so much trouble with carpal versus tarsal. And now we have carpal tunnel syndrome and now nobody has any trouble with this. Your carpal is your wrist. The pollux is your thumb and the hallux is your big toe. Manual has to do with your hand. Digital, this has to do with both your fingers and your toes. So the coxal region is your hip bones. Sometimes the region is named after something like the bone that runs under it. So the femoral region is the part of the leg, the upper leg where the femur runs. And the patella is your kneecap. So your patella region is where your knee hinge is. And the popliteal or popliteal. So I haven't come up with a consensus because people are split on how to pronounce that one. But that's the other side of your knee. So if you're talking about the front or the anterior or the ventral, then you're talking about the patella region. But if you're talking about the back of the knee, which you would see from the dorsal side or the posterior side, that would be the popliteal or popliteal. Crural, that one's hard to say, crural. I mean, it's easy to say rural, but you got to put the on it first. Crural is your lower leg. All right, both crural and sural have to do with the lower leg, but one's the front and one's the back. Now, this is one of the ones that's hotly contested right now, is peroneal region. They're trying to rename that one the fibular region because it runs along the bone that is the fibula, and that makes perfect sense. But the problems you run into is we have the peroneal nerve, we have peroneal uh, muscle area, so... You're going to have to go all in and rename everything fibular or leave it all uh, peroneal. Pedal is your foot. That's easy. You pedal your bicycle with your foot, so you won't have any trouble with that one. And tarsal is your ankle. Hallux is your big toe. And one of the tarsal bones is the calcaneal bone. And that one actually makes up your heel bone. So you need to know that one because we're going to be doing calcaneal reflexes in another lab. So we will revisit that. The Achilles tendon attaches to the calcaneal region or to the heel. So your activity for the third section is label this guy in the front and the back. Now, he is standing in the correct anatomical position uh, with the exception. Oh, look, he, he's... Oh, he's doing it wrong. He looks like he's standing on his tiptoes. Uh, and he is because he's wanting you to see the underside of his foot. But by doing it that way, he's putting the anterior surface towards the posterior surface. So he is not doing the correct anatomical position thing right there. Okay, and they can't very well do the correct anatomical position there because then you step from anatomy into pornography. So this is the doll that we looked at, and you feel free to get one or on this piece of paper. You know, you can print this piece of paper out of the lab manual, and then you can label the, the what is the name for the thumb. That's the pollux. Where's the carpal on the doll? Right there. There's the doll's wrist. So you can see the carpal region. Hopefully the doll will not get carpal tunnel syndrome. And there's the back side of the doll. So there's a gluteus maximus, the gluteal region right there. And right there is the cervical region. Here's one that some students get incorrectly. 
because, again, this is easy. You have your upper and your lower. Upper and lower. So you're not going to mess those two up. What you're going to mess up is if you reach your right hand out, you're going to be touching this guy's left upper quadrant. So you have to keep thinking you're, it's the patient's left and right, not your left and right. So whatever it takes for you to memorize that. They don't let me make out the test, but if they did, this would be one of the test questions I would give you. I would give you this picture, and I would ask you, what is this area right here? So this is the area above the knee, and that would be the femoral region because the femur bone runs through it. But this is the baloney. You can also divide the abdominopelvic region into nine areas or nine regions. Some of these are fairly easy. For example, here's your waist running across your belly button right there. So here's your left lumbar and here's your right lumbar. So that's fairly easy. The belly button is the umbilical region. So that one's super easy. Now, where you get into the kind of weird is the right hypochondriac and the left hypochondriac. So we know the word hypochondriac is someone who thinks they're sick all the time. So if you run into some hypochondriac and you say, oh my gosh, my nose is running and my, I've coughed until my muscles and my chest hurt. And they're like, oh yeah, me too. Oh, me too. I have it. And not only that, but my lungs are filling up. So whatever you have, they have it, and they usually have it worse than you do. So I find that funny. So where are you going to make the mistake? If you make the mistake, is thinking that this is the right, and it's not. This is his left, and this is his right hypochondriac. So there's the right and the left, right and the left, right and the left. When you learn the bones, the coxal bones, you're going to learn that that, that uh Crest, when you put your hands on your hips, you're putting your hands along a curved bone, the hip bone, and that's the iliac bone. So they've named that the iliac region. So there's your left iliac and there's your right iliac. Two in the middle are misnamed because epigastric means on top of your stomach and hypogastric means below your stomach. Gastric means stomach. And those are misnamed because that's not where your stomach is. But most people think that is. So if you ask most people where their stomach is, they're going to put their hand on their belly button. And they're going to say, my stomach's right here behind my belly button. And what you're, what you're touching are your intestines. That's not where your stomach is. So I think the reason for that is because when your stomach is growling, it's actually gas moving through the intestines rather than say oh my gosh excuse me i have gas moving in my intestines i think i'm gonna have to fart um you just go oh my stomach is growling so i think that's where that came from but anyway for whatever reason there's your epa which means upon or on top of the stomach and hypo means below the stomach. So here is your exercise for this or your activity for this. You need to label the four upper and lower, right and left. And then you need to label the nine. So I always start in the middle if I'm playing tic-tac-toe. And so that would be your umbilical region. And look at that. See? There's your intestines. That's what you hear growling. Not your stomach. That's not where your stomach is. All right. And then our last of the four things that you need to learn for this particular lab is how to use the microscope. Well, in order to be able to use the microscope, you need to know the names or the, of the parts of the microscope. And then you need to learn the words that have to do with focusing. There are dissecting microscopes that allow you to see large things, like you can take the heart out of something and look at its heart. We're going to be using what they call compound light microscopes. So we're using light to visualize what's under the screen. If I was captain of the world, we would have uh, electron microscopes. But they run about a million dollars each, 
and we don't have that kind of money. So light microscopes are what we use. You can only see to about a thousand times, which is usually enough to see pretty much everything you want to see. But once you've seen stuff with an electron microscope, it's like, oh my goodness. But anyway, so we're going to learn the light microscope. And you can have them with one eyepiece or two eyepieces. And the name of the eyepiece is the ocular, so it would be a monocular or a binocular. Most of the ones you're going to see in lab are going to be binocular. So you have one ocular for your left eye and your one for your right eye. And then you have the body tube, which most people call the neck. And there's the arm. So when you pick up your microscope, you're going to hold it by its arm. And then you're going to slip the other hand under the base. You're going to carry it by its arm and its base and put it over on your table. The reason you do that is because some microscopes have the oculars loose. So if you're just picking it up by the arm and you're swinging it as you're carrying it back over to your table, bits and pieces go flying off. And some of those bits and pieces are kind of expensive. Carry it by its arm and support it by its base. That's the proper way to carry it. Now this part right here is called the stage. And you've probably heard the Shakespearean all the world's a stage. Right here is where you're going to put the slide that you're going to be looking at. And you have this little thing. It looks like a pair of fingers reaching out right here. And that is your stage clips. So you pull this little piece back, this little finger looking piece back, put your slide right there over this hole, and then you gently ease that back down onto the slide and it'll hold it in place. Underneath the stage, and you can't see it from this view, they, it, but you, have, you can see it on the other side of the stage, there is an XY joystick. And it moves your slide to the left and the right, and it moves it forwards and backwards. So you can position it over this little lens right here. The light coming out of the base, and it's called the substage light because it's below. And then the light goes through, and you have a condenser that takes the light and puts it into a little tiny beam that fits up, goes up into the little lens that's the end of the objective. This is called the nose piece right there. It is also called the revolving nose piece because it can click around. So you have three or four objectives on the nose piece. Now, your microscopes have three, but when you take med micro, me, uh, medical microbiology, you'll have four because you have a special one just for looking at bacteria. I got a picture of another microscope and zoomed in on it so you can see some more of the features. I think this is a little bit clearer. So there's your stage clip, and you're just going to pull this finger back and put your slide right there. So you can see there's a slide already in there. Here are your objectives. When you look at your objectives, you're going to see that there's a blue one, a red one, and a yellow one. You always start with the red objective. Always. So that's super, super important. Now, when you go down here, this is the XY joystick that I was talking about and you can turn this and it'll slide the slide to the left or right or up and down. So you can see it a little bit better on this microscope right here. But the main thing I wanted to show you guys, so many people who use a microscope, they're they're looking at something under the microscope and they say, oh, Miss Drake, I can't see anything. Can you come over here and help me? And I'm like, okay. So I go over to help them. Well, what they've done is this is a little lever underneath the stage. So here's your stage right here. Here's your slide. Here's the hole under the slide that lets the light through. So there's a condenser under here that lets the light come through. And this little knob or lever rather sticking out right here is the iris diaphragm. Some people just call it the diaphragm for short. But I call it the iris diaphragm because it does the same thing 
that the iris in your eye does. So when you go outside and there's way too much light, your iris, the muscles behind it, we're going to learn about that in one of our labs, <clears throat> make the pupil smaller. So you don't have as much light coming through, and so you're not blinded by the light. And then if it's dark outside, then your pupils dilate, and now you can see more. You can because you, you have your pupils opened up really, really wide. So whatever light there is can come in. Well, the microscope doesn't have a brain, so what you're gonna have to do is you are gonna have to use your finger on this this lever, and if you pull it over to one side, it turns the light coming through to almost no light. Or if you push it the other way, then you're going to open up the iris diaphragm and a lot more light is going to come through from your substage light up through your condenser. This is, you're going to have to manually move this. And if too much light is coming through, it's like when you're trying to look outside and there's too much light and you just can't see. I don't know if you've been driving and the sun is in your eyes and it is so hard to see the road and so hard to see the cars. It's really scary. So in that case, you use your iris in your eye and try to cut out as much light as you can. And you may even have to use sunglasses to cut down on the light. But a lot of times I just walk over and look through the kids' um, eyepiece, their ocular, and I go, well, <clears throat> first thing is you got so much light coming through you can't see anything. So I reach down and get the iris diaphragm and move it over and cut down on some of the light. And all of a sudden, there's the thing that they're trying to see before they just had too much light. Use your iris diaphragm. It is your friend. Another important thing that you need to know about is your fine focus. So it's this little knob inside this big knob. And the big knob is your coarse focus. C-O-A-R-S-E. Your coarse focus. If you turn your red objective right here, it's your 4x or your scanning objective. If you move it around using the nose piece and click it into place, so right now the yellow one is over the stage, but spin yours around until the red one is over the stage and now it's a very short objective so you can freely move the course focus and you don't have to worry about making this metal rod drive through the slide. If you have the yellow objective, which is the 10x objective, over the stage and you start using the course focus knob, there's a good chance that this will go down through the slide, break the slide, and then continue on down and break the condenser and the lenses. You never, ever want to use the coarse focus unless you have the red 4X objective over the stage. It's short enough that you can't hurt anything. That's why we always start with the 4X objective. Put your 4X objective over the slide. Use your coarse focus to bring the stage up as far as it will go, but don't ever force it. If you try to force it, you're going to end up stripping the gears and then the microscope won't work anymore. So just gently turn the course focus and watch. You'll see the stage comes up, comes up, comes up until it's very close to the object. All you have to do is just look through the eyepieces, which are called oculars, and gently slowly lower the stage and once you see whatever it is on your slide then you start using the fine focus and you just tweak it a little bit backwards or a little bit forwards and you'll see all of a sudden whatever it is pop into view so if you've ever had an eye exam they do something similar to this They'll be flipping these little lenses over and go, is it better with A or is it better with B? Coarse focus, fine focus. Never, ever use the coarse focus unless you're using the red 4X objective. That is the only time you're allowed to use it. Because all of these others are so long 
then you might end up driving them through the slide. Here is what's really cool about the microscopes that we have, and like a microscope like this one, and that nose piece, it is angled so that if you have focused with your 4X objective and you can see whatever's on the slide, all you have to do is just dial around the nose piece to the yellow, and it's also in focus, or dial around to the 40X objective, and it'll also be in focus. So once you focus one of the objectives, all of them are focused at the same time. So that's called parfocal, P-A-R-F-O-C-A-L, parfocal. When one is in focus, they're all in focus. So once you sh switch from your 4X objective to your 10X objective, you go from having something 40 times bigger than what it is in real life, because this is four, ocular is 10. So if you multiply your objective, which is four, by your ocular, which is 10, you get your total magnification. If I were to switch from the 4X to the 10X, now I'm getting 10 times the ocular and 10 times the objective. So whatever I'm looking at will be 100 times bigger than real life. If I switch around to the 40X objective and multiply that by the 10 ocular, then whatever I'm looking at is 400 times. When I was teaching Med Micro, one of the cool things that we discovered that I didn't even think about is if you take a picture through the eyepiece or through the ocular, you can, you can hold your phone up to the microscope, take a picture, and then once you've taken the picture, you know how you can use your fingers to, to spread your fingers apart and the picture gets bigger? And so we were able, by using the microscope and by using our phones, to go from a thousand magnification to three thousand magnification because your phone uh, goes over three times magnification if you spread your fingers and enlarge the picture. So anyway, we were seeing details on bacteria that I had never seen before without an electron microscope. So I was so excited. So this is the microscope that you got in your lab manual. And I think I covered everything. I didn't talk about the light dimmer switch right here. So here, the best thing is use your iris diaphragm. And it's that little lever that just swivels around to the side and swivels back around to the other side. But you can also change your light here at the base. Not all microscopes have that, but I believe that yours do. Here's a nice summary table that shows you each of the parts that you need to know and what they do. So hopefully I've covered all of that with you. Here's the step-by-step -step that tells you how to use your microscope. So the first thing is to safely carry it to your, from the cabinet over to your bench top. So it says use both hands, one of them on the arm and the other under the base. So that's the, that's the first thing. Once you get it there, you take the dust cover off. And the dust cover is to keep dust from getting on the lenses. Because imagine if you can see dust what that dust would look like if it was magnified times 100 or times 400. It will obscure whatever it is you're looking at. The other thing that I think is funny is the ladies who wear a lot of mascara, when they're looking through the microscope, they're going to be looking at their own eyelashes. So a lot of times they're wondering what these black things are that they're seeing uh, curled up on the microscope, and it's their own eyelashes that they're seeing. Now, there is, in one of the oculars, in one of the eyepieces, there is a, a black metal rod, a little teeny tiny one, and it's a pointer. So it's kind of nice. If you have something on your slide that you want to show the teacher or you want to show your lab partner, then you can use the XY joystick and move the slide over until you get it to where whatever it is you want them to see is being pointed at by the little metal pointer. And it's actually built into the ocular. 
So that's always disconcerting to people when they suddenly see a, a little black finger pointing at something um, inside of their microscope. But it's deliberately there so you can your teacher something. Step six is the where I was talking about. You always start with a 4x objective. And at the end of the day, when you put your microscope back away, as a courtesy, it's usually nice to put the 4x objective down so that when the next person comes along, the correct objective is already in place. Okay, and once you look at that, the 4x objective gives you the largest field of view. You can see more things on the slide with that particular lens. So if you were to look at the end of the objective, you'll see that the opening for the 4x is much larger than the one. So as you go up to the 10x and then the 40x and then the 100x, you're going to see the hole gets tinier and tinier and tinier. So your field of view gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you go up through the objectives. So if you want to see as much of the slide as you possibly can at one time, then the 4x objective is the best one for that. And then you can kind of look around and see, oh, there's something over there that I want to see. And then you can zoom in on another area. It should be intuitive that if you've got the biggest hole with the most light coming through on the 4x objective, you probably need to cut down your light using your iris diaphragm. Once you get up to like the 40x objective, then you probably want to open your iris diaphragm and let more light through because you have a much smaller hole. And there's that word parfocal right there, if you can see my cursor moving. Parfocal means if you've got it focused on the 4x objective, it's also on the 10x objective and the 40x objective and even the 100x objective if we were using oil immersion. So, once you've got it in focus for 4x, all you need is the fine focus. You never, ever use the coarse focus unless you're on the 4x objective. See, look, they even put it right there in big letters. They made it there. When you do something in caps, you're shouting. So this activity is fairly easy. They just, you need to look on the red objective, the little short stubby one, and you'll see a 4x. So right here you write 4x. And then what is your low power, the yellow? You look on that objective and it says 10x. And the blue says 40x. And the oil immersion says 100x. Meaning that's how much it multiplies times. Now, the magnification of the ocular lens. Almost all ocular lenses are 10x, but it should say on it what it is. Now, if you want to spend more money, you can get a 20x ocular, but we have 10x. So all you have to be able to do is say 10 times 4 is 40. 10 times 10 is 100. 10 times 40 is 400. And 10 times 100 is 1,000. So the math's pretty easy there. You're just multiplying by 10. All right, for those of you who are in class, we're going to do a wet mount, and I call it a spit sandwich, because what you're gonna do is you're gonna get a cover slip and a slide and a toothpick, and you're going to lightly rub the inside of your cheek. So you're gonna get some of the cells that are inside your cheek, as well as some of the spit that's in your mouth, and you're gonna roll the toothpick around on your slide and you should see like a little wet area and then if you want to stain it we have methylene blue dye and it is a cell stain it stains cells you are made of cells if you spill methylene blue on you it will stain your cells blue so I'm just telling you, be careful. It won't hurt you, but you'll walk around looking funny for a while until your skin wears off. Okay? So methylene blue is a cell stain, and it will stain your cells as well as the cheek cells that you just put on your slide. All right, so you got your slide. You've got some of your spit 
and cells smeared out over it. And you put a little tiny, tiny, tiny drop of methylene blue. If you put a great big wad of it, then when you try to put your cover slip on, it'll just slide off because it'll be so wet that, that, that it can't attach to the slide. So that's an art right there, a small drop. What I have my students do is I have them take a clean toothpick and put a little drop of blue on the toothpick and smear that in on the slide. And that way you only get a little bit of moisture in because you already have spit on your slide, you know, that you uh, rubbed off the inside of your mouth. And now you're adding blue liquid on top of that. All right. And then put your cover slip on and now you have a spit sandwich. Underneath is the slide. On top of it is the cover slip. And you're ready to go look at it under the microscope. So sneaking over to Google, I looked up cheek cells under the microscope. And this is what you should see. This is what your cells will look like. Now this is low power, so you have a large field of vision. So you're able to see all this stuff right here. And if you zoom in, now you can see much more detail. You can't see as many cells but you can see the ones that you can see in much more detail. So here's a cell. It's kind of wrinkled a little bit, kind of got folded over a little bit. And there's the nucleus inside there. There's all different stains. We're using methylene blue, but you can use crystal violet. You can use all kinds of different colors. This is what your cheek cells would look like if you didn't stain them. And since they are colorless and, and transparent, they're kind of hard to see. I think they may have added just a little stain just to stain the nucleus. Your next activity is to sketch what you see if you're using the 4x or the scanning objective. And then the low power is the 10x objective and the high power is the 40x objective. Again, we're not going to use the 100x objective because we're not looking for bacteria. We have a few more terms that you need to learn about the microscope. And one of them is called the lens effect. And in this one, if you take a letter E, but when you look at it under the microscope, you're going to find that it will flip it and invert it. And so that's the lens effect. That's what happens because you're looking through a lens, which is going to flip the image for you. Even though you put it in correctly, this is what happens. It gets turned upside down and reverse left to right. So here are the five terms you need to know. We've talked about the lens effect. We've talked about the field of view. The field size is the size of the field of view. And then the working distance is how far is the objective lens from the slide. So when you're doing the 4x objective, there's quite a large working distance between the two. But when you use the nose piece and you dial around to the 10x or the 40x, it's kind of scary because you think that the objective is actually going to hit the slide, but it will clear it with just a tiny, tiny little gap. So the working distance is smaller and smaller as you go up through the larger objectives, the, from the 4x to the 10x to the 40x to the 100x. Image resolution is how much you can see at a given magnification. So if you remember back when we looked at the cheek cells, how much detail you could see under the 4X, it, you could hardly see anything. I mean, you could see the cells and you could see the nucleus, but you couldn't really make out too much. But if you were to dial up to the 10X, then all of a sudden you can easily see the nucleus and you can easily see the cell membrane. So if you went all the way up to the 40x, uh, which would be 400 total magnification, or if we uh, were in med micro lab and you were looking at a cheek cell and looking under the 100x, so everything is a thousand times bigger, not only would you see your cheek cell, but you would see little bacteria eating your cheek cell. So that's kind of a fun thing to do. Something to look forward to when you get into med micro. We have a few prepared slides we'd like for you to look at. One of them is the paramecium. 
which is a, it's a little one-celled organism. It's got cilia all over the outside of it, and it's got a groove that actually makes it look like a woman's shoe. It almost looks like you could pick it up and put your foot in the hole. And this is what a paramecium looks like if it's stained. So you have, you can see the little cilia, the little hair-like things sticking up on it. And there's a groove that runs along here that looks like you could put your foot down inside of it. Make sure you look at the paramecium under low power and high power to see how much of the paramecium you can see because it's a fairly large um, one-celled organism. So when you're looking at the forex, you may be able to see a number of them, but once you get up to the 40x, which would be 400 magnification, you may only be able to see half of one paramecium. These are really good thought questions because we've gone over these words, but now that you're actually playing with the microscope and looking at stuff, how does this work for you? So what is the working distance as you went up from 4x to 10x to 40x objective? So what happened to the working distance? What happened to the field size? What happened to the brightness? How much light was up coming up through the condenser in the stage? And resolution. How much stuff could you see at each of the magnifications? You, you should find that you may have much higher resolution after you're using the 40x objective. So you're looking at something 400 times bigger. All right. Uh, you need to let me see that you've done the work. So if you're doing this in person, you can actually show it to me. If you are taking this as an online course, then you're going to have to let me see what you have done. So you can email me snapshots. All right. Next time we meet, you will have a quiz over this lab at the beginning of lab. So you'll walk in, you'll have a quiz, and then we'll start lab exercise two.